If you have your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 6 with me, please. Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah is called the prince of the prophets and uh, for various reasons. If you'll notice, it says in verse number 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Father, bless his holy book. In thy name I pray, man. My future, my hope, my life, my dreams are tied up in this book. Amen. Amen. This book, the Bible, the Word of God. It's the most astounding thing that I ever, ever touched in my life. It's not made by man. How do you know that, preacher? Look how man treats it today. Men, holy men of God, spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It is not of human origin. It came down from above. This is what we call inspired scripture. Isaiah is quite a prophet, folks. In the sixth chapter of Isaiah, the year that King Uzziah died, if you studied the Bible, you know he was the leprous king. They warned him, don't try to come into the office of the priest and do what we do. He did anyway, and God smote him with leprosy from that day on, and he withered away and died. And so we, what we read here in Isaiah chapter number 6 is a picture of comparison between the glory of God, the glory of the enthroned one, and a leprous king. Now it has to do geographically, it has to do historically, it has to do practically, doctrinally, and all these things in, in context where it is. But we're going to use it as a starting point tonight to move on to something else. But look at what it says in verse number 2. In Isaiah chapter number 6 and verse 2, And it stood, above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. Now this is shows absolute reverence and no doubt probably an element of fear because these creatures were coming into the presence of the Holy, Holy, Holy One. They cover their eyes, they cover their feet, and they fly. A seraphim is from the Hebrew word seraph, which means burning, burning. Then you read over there in the book of Numbers, and you'll find where the burning, burning serpents bit the people. So the Bible tells us here in the presence of this Holy One that is unmistakably beyond anything human. Verse 3, one cried to, cried to another, and said, Holy, 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 kadosh, 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 is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with glory, with smoke that appeared as the glory of God. Isaiah, as all the rest of us would do in the presence of that, said, Woe Amen. is me. <laughs> Amen. I'd be finding me a hole to crawl into. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of glory, the Lord of hosts. And this, my friend, is what fellowship is about. Because real fellowship is, stands in awe of the Lord. It never ceases to. And real fellowship shows you who you are and what you are. If you ever come in contact with the glory of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the glory of God in the face of God Almighty, you ever come into the presence of that, and you'll be crying, woe is me, and then you're on your way to fellowship with God. So the Bible said, flew one of the seraphim having unto me having a live coal in his hand which he'd taken with the tongs from off the altar and laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips and thine iniquity is taken away. Now we could continue on reading this, but I want to make a point here and then we'll move on. What you have in Isaiah chapter number 6 is a beautiful picture of the Lord of hosts, high and lifted up. Look at verse number 3. Holy, holy, holy. Look at the capital L-O-R-D. That's printer's type. It means that Jehovah, the tetragrammaton is here. Yod, hey, thou, hey. And right here is Lord, okay? You've got two lords. Look at verse number one. See the small letters? Then in verse number three, the capital letters. Now, I'm going to make a connection with this later on, so keep that in your mind. What we have here is Jehovah of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We have in Isaiah chapter number six a beautiful picture of the glory of God. 
for his creatures to be able to come into his presence. The Lord has to do a lot to allow creatures to come into his presence. You understand that? You understand that if in the full blazing glory of Almighty God that we'd be consumed in a heartbeat, and the only way that we could ever come into his presence is to be accepted in the beloved, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we have here in Isaiah chapter number 6 is a beautiful picture that Isaiah is giving us of the vision he had of the glory of God. The Bible said in Psalm chapter number 24 verses 7 through 10, Who is this king of glory as he ascends into the presence of God, into the holy hill or holy mountain of God? Did you know that 2,000 years ago that 5,000 male Jewish voices a male choir of 5,000 sang on top of that mountain to the glory of God. You realize how important music is to the Jews, folks? 150 psalms. These are songs to be sung. Singing was everywhere for the glory of God. You know where singing came from? It came from heaven. Ezekiel chapter number 28. Song is a gift of God to his people. Night and day, 24-7, to sing praises to the Almighty. Did you know that in Thailand, 24-7, day in and day out, they're singing and giving praise to Buddha? Do you realize that? Do you understand over there that in, uh, in, in Istanbul, Turkey, Istanbul, Turkey, at the, at the church of Hagia Sophia, that they turned into a Muslim mosque, that there in, in, in this land, in, in Istanbul, Turkey, that they read from the Koran, never stop reading, 24-7, continuous reading from the Koran. Why do they do that? Because they feel it's important. Why do these, why do these girls sing to Buddha 24-7? Because Buddha's important to them. Well, let me tell you something, folks. Got no use for Buddha. He can't help me. He can't do a thing for me. But I can sing praises to the Lord God Jehovah 24-7. From my heart and from my soul, I can sing unto him. So who could ascend to the presence of God? Who could ascend to that hill where the Almighty is located? You remember what the devil said? I will ascend above the thrones of God, above the stars of God. I will lift up my, my throne above God Almighty. This is what he said. Why did he say it? He said it because he would attempt to do it by his own beauty. I don't think anything ever existed more beautiful than this anointed cherub that covereth in Ezekiel 28. It's beautiful. Beautiful. He was connected with beauty. He was connected with music. He was connected with glory. He was connected with all the privileged things that we little creatures down here on earth would love to be connected with, don't you think? But he fell from it. He fell from it. He fell from it because by his own ability, his own beauty, his own effort, he thought he could ascend above the stars of God, above the throne of the Almighty. Who can do that, the question goes forth. Who is worthy to ascend above the throne of God or above where God is, seated on his throne? There's one. There's one. And you read about him in Psalm 24. Who shall ascend? Who is this king of glory? And in Antiphony. And antiphony means that one side sings and the other side answers. This side speaks, this side answers. And back and forth and back and forth they go while Christ ascends to the top of that mountain. Who is this that dares ascend into the very presence of God? It is the man Christ Jesus. It is the God-man who lived a sinless, perfect life on this earth. And by his righteousness, God opens glory and accepts him into his presence. In plain words, listen, folks, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sinless, perfect Son of God, was equal to the righteousness of Almighty God seated upon that throne. Meditate on that a while. <laughs> Let that sink in a while. Think about that. Who would dare? I wouldn't dare. <laughs> You'd find me running in the opposite direction. The only way I know that I'll ever make it into the presence of God is through the Lord Jesus Christ, whose name is to be blessed forevermore. So this is what Isaiah sees, and Isaiah understands this. He understands all about it. He sees the glory of God. But now the book of Isaiah is 66 chapters. And I'm sure it's been pointed out to you many times before that the Bible is 66 chapters. And I'm sure that it's been pointed out to you that the 39th chapter of Isaiah and the 40th chapter of Isaiah are completely broken. There's two separate, almost like two separate books the 40th chapter of Isaiah picks up with the servant of the Lord. 
The first 39 chapters of Isaiah are dealing with the enemies of Jehovah, the enemies of Israel. But then we have a focus now. The focus is upon the servant of the Lord from chapter number 40 on. Remember though, in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, we see the glory of God. We see the, man we see the magnificence, the majesty of Almighty God. And it's quite a thing. Here in Isaiah chapter number 6, it says, His train did fill the temple. This has that glory that just sparkles off of him and goes off into a train. Did you know that when, when Princess Diana got married in St. Paul's Cathedral, she had a train following behind her? Have you watched that? Have you ever watched that, that, that wedding? That train was 25 feet long. Something to think about. I've never been to a wedding 25 foot long train. That means they get through the door and the train still be back here in the door while the, while the bride's standing down here in the front. So what it's trying to say, it's trying to say that she held a high position, that she was marrying into royalty. Fact of the matter is, she was marrying the crown prince, the future king of England. And so she had in every sense of the word, she had to meet that qualification and stand in that position and be where she should have been in, uh, in, in this train. So nothing more can be said about it. It's one of the most remarkable things in all the Bible. And that is what happens there in Isaiah chapter number 6. But Isaiah then in the second part of the book, chapter number 40 through 66, begins to focus on another picture. And it's not one exalted upon a, cross, upon a hill, on a throne. It's not one with glory falling from him and, and a train behind him and seraphim crying, holy, holy, holy. No, what happens is we come to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Now listen carefully. These these books, 27 of them, from chapter number 40 to chapter number 20, chapter number 66, there are 27 books that comprise that part of Isaiah. That is three times nine. Three nines are 27. If you take this and look at it and break it down, you'll find this. You'll find chapters 40 through 48 have to do with the supremacy of Jehovah. You'll find chapters 49 through 57 that have to do with the servant of Jehovah. And then in chapter 58 through 66, you find the ascent or the challenge of Jehovah. If you take this 27 books and find the center point of all 27 of them, the center point, the center chapter, do you know what you're going to find? Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter number 53 is one of the most important passages in all the Bible. It's so very important that Jews down through the centuries have quoted it. They've dealt with it because they know that it's a powerful, powerful thing. And if you talk to a Jew today, a, a rabbi today, he will tell you that the servant of the Lord and that one in Isaiah chapter number 53, he'll tell you that that is uh, Israel. He'll say, this is Israel. And you go back a few decades, a few hundred years in time, and go back to the ancient Jewish sages and see what they said about Isaiah chapter number 53. And here's what one said. He said, this passage, the, com the commentators explain, speaks of the captivity of Israel. Although the singular number is used in it throughout, others have supposed it to mean that just in this present world who are crushed and oppressed now, but these two for the same reason, by altering the number, distort the verse from its natural meaning. And then it seems to me that having forsaken the knowledge of our teachers and inclined after the stubbornness of their own hearts and of their own opinion, I am pleased to interpret it in accordance with the teaching of the rabbis of the King Messiah. Yes, that's what they taught. Many, many, many. All you got to do is Google it, and you'll find many references to that. Here's another uh, rabbi. He said, I may remark then that our rabbis with one voice accept and affirm the opinion that the prophet is speaking of the King Messiah, my servant. So what's the problem then, preacher? Well, the problem is this. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train did fill the temple. He's a glorious reigning king. He's the Messiah, the Mashiach, the anointed of God. But on the other hand, in Isaiah chapter number 53, he is humiliated. He's brought down. He's nailed to a horrible cross. And there he suffers and bleeds and dies for us. So how could the two of them be true? How could it be so? So the Jews have this answer. They say, well, in Isaiah 6, it's talking about 
a Messiah which is the reigning Messiah, the one who will come and bring us great joy and peace, and we shall shed ourselves of our enemies. And then there is, they teach that the second Messiah is the suffering, bleeding Messiah to fulfill the scripture. The problem is they've got two Messiahs. The answer to that is very simple. The reigning, glorified, eternal Messiah is the one who will come again to receive us into himself. But when he came the first time, he came as the suffering, bleeding, dying Messiah of Isaiah chapter number 53. There's not two Messiahs. There's one. Only one. There's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And that is the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The New Testament takes Isaiah 53 very, important, very, very seriously because it quotes it time and again. As a matter of fact, it is quoted seven times in the Word of God. You know the number seven? You know how important it is? Seven is the number of divine completion or perfection. It doesn't get any more perfect than seven. You can't improve upon seven. So what's the next number after seven? Eight. And the number eight is the number of new beginnings. It all starts over again. And the gematria of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is eight, eight, eight. And I thought to myself, you know something, this is not coincidental. These things are not worked in here and weaved in this like fabric of a human mind. This is from the almighty God. So it's quoted in Matthew 8, John 12, Luke 22. 1 Peter 2, Acts 8, and Romans 10. They quote Isaiah chapter number 53. Must be that it means something, don't you think? Turn to John chapter 12 with me. John chapter number 12 tonight. And here is one place that it's quoted, and it's quoted by the Apostle John. The Apostle John. In John chapter number 12 and verse number 37. John 12, 37. The Bible said that though he had done so many miracles before them, Yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Esaias, Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now watch him quote another passage from Isaiah. Therefore they could not believe, because that Esaias, or Isaiah, said again, he hath blinded their eyes, hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Now look at verse 41. Stop a moment and take in what you're about to read. In verse number 41 of, of John 12, And these things spake Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Who? <laughs> Who's the context? He saw his glory. Whose glory did he see? In Isaiah chapter number 6, he saw the glory of Jehovah. He saw the glory of Almighty God. And yet, John the Apostle says that was the Lord Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate state. He left the glories of heaven. He left the riches of heaven. He left the power of heaven. He left his place in heaven, his name in heaven, all that he was. And he descended down to this earth. He left the throne of glory and the power of God. And he came down to die on a cross and suffer and bleed. As lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. They're seeing two sides to God. God's a balanced being. God allowed sin to come so he could destroy it. And doing it, you'd see the wisdom of God. The Bible said that through the church of God right now is manifest the wisdom of God. Think on that. The church right now, the body of Christ, the ecclesia, called out assembly, is manifesting the manifold wisdom of God. Don't ever think tonight, folks, that we'll ever understand everything we want. But here's one thing that we can certainly accept and preach and promote, and that is that the God we serve tonight knows the end and the beginning, allows nothing to happen without his will, and never reacts to anything. Known unto God are all of his works. So you're here tonight. How'd you get here tonight? I saw three women yesterday on a uh, news program, and they were interviewing these three women. <laughs> and I thought it was quite a remarkable thing because <clears throat> all of them had been aborted. Every one of them had been aborted. And I looked at these people, and these are, these, are, these are human beings. They're women. They're just like the rest of us. And they were talking. They were interviewing them. And yet the abortion failed. And I looked at them, and I thought, 63 million times 
They've killed people like this. Meditate on that tonight. Think about who you're dealing with. These women, of course, are very thankful that they, uh, that they, that they, that they, they, they live through the abortion. And I want you to notice something else about it tonight. I don't imagine in my mind a more selfish, personal, greedy idea that for somebody whose mother allowed them to be born, get this, ever walking soul on this earth, except people like this who were aborted and still lived, every last one of them had a mother that made a choice that they'd be alive. And all of these people screaming into their microphones and marching through the streets and cursing you. Think about it. Their mother let them live. Yet they don't want to do the same thing. You talk about selfishness. It doesn't get any more selfish than that. Led as a lamb to the slaughter. And he opened not his mouth. Now don't you look at the book of Revelation. The Lord Jesus Christ. You know I've been talking to you for some time now about the Lamb of God. In Revelation chapter number 5. And verse number 6, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the unveiling, the, the unfolding, the making known, the manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse number 6, it says in Revelation 5, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Here's the first time that the Lamb is exalted and enthroned. Notice carefully, the Lamb takes the place of the one on the throne and everything gathers around the Lamb. All of the attention now is paid to the Lamb. And of course, as I said this morning, it's the Lamb who opens the book. It's the Lamb who's qualified, who is worthy, and it's the Lamb of God. And when he opens it, we start, my dear friend, with seals, then trumpets, and then vials. So here we have one enthroned, but it's in a step process. Look at Revelation chapter number 11 and verse number 15. Revelation eleven fifteen. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were given voices in heaven. There were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, you know, folks, I'm not a post or I'm a limbalist. I believe there are a lot of good people in that. I believe I love the Lord. I'm not here to, tonight to judge anybody. I know some of them. I know some of the preachers. They're good people. But, folks, I'm premillennial. I'm premillennial for a lot of reasons. Here's one of them. We don't have the kingdom yet. He hasn't taken the kingdom yet, but he will. He will come and take it. In Revelation 11, he'll come and take it. He will take that which is rightfully his. Notice carefully. Here, the, the, the lamb, the lamb, Jehovah, in Isaiah chapter number 6, Jehovah. <laughs> These Jehovah's Witnesses, they ought to be, they, you know, they, 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 today they're saying Yahweh. <laughs> Do you say Yahweh? Well, that's not going to. That's not going to make it. I have fellowship with you. If you if you say Yahweh, say Yahweh. But well, let me tell you something. I had better. You have to give me a good reason to drop Jehovah. You know why? Number one, you get all the old commentaries, and I get the old ones, stuff two hundred years old, and I read what they said in a different age than this one. The word Yahweh doesn't show up one time. It's all Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah. Even the liberal stuff, Jehovah, 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 Jehovah. See, Jehovah. That means Jesus is Jehovah. God saves. The Savior. So here he is in Revelation chapter number 11 saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of, kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. I want to say it again. And I don't, sometimes I have a hard time getting this across. Do you have it fixed in your mind what the Father looks like? I hope you don't. <laughs> I hope you don't. I hope you don't have it fixed in your mind even the essence of the Father. I hope you don't. This is why he said to them in the Old Testament, don't you make an image of me. Don't you dare make something that looks like me because you don't have a clue what I look like. 
All you can see is glory that I let you see. So when it comes to the Son and to the Father, there is a relationship there that is not easy to put into words. And as far as deity is concerned, there is no difference. The Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. One God, eternally existing as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, don't you look at Revelation chapter number 20 with me tonight, please. Revelation 20 and verse number 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Do you remember what he told his disciples after he arose from the dead? This is after now. This is after he arose from the dead. He said, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. This is after he arose from the dead. In plain words, all judgment and all power is mine from henceforth. Why? Because he was the last Adam. The first Adam was given life and brought you death. The last Adam died and gave you life. The first Adam lost what he had in a garden. The last Adam won back what was lost in the garden. There's a vast difference between the two, and yet they are comparable. And there are many things about them that are the same. This is why the Lord Jesus is called the last Adam. He arose from the dead, and here's what it says. He was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Now, when you read your Bible, you'll see time and again, God the Father would say, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Do you think the Father was pleased? And of course he was. The Lord Jesus did always those things that pleased the Father. And so God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So what's he talking about? What's Romans talking about when he says he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead? That word declared, look at it carefully, and here's what it means. Set aside, set apart, attention paid, nothing like him. Don't compare him to Michael. Don't compare him to Gabriel. Don't compare him to any angel. He's alone and of himself. He has a holiness that there is none other, nowhere to be found. He's one of a kind. There's nothing like him. No one ever showed up before like him. No one will ever show up again like him. He is all there is. This is my beloved son, declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. The Bible says that we have been begotten, begotten, begotten to a lively hope. Listen carefully to what Peter says. Begotten to a lively hope by the resurrection of Christ or Jesus from the dead. That resurrection was a big deal, folks. Not only was a victor over death, hell, and the grave, he came forth with power and authority and an identity that once he rose from the dead, that all was manifested. And I enjoy it tonight. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, when he was writing about death, he quoted an Old Testament scripture, and he put death in its context. He said, oh, death, where's your sting? The strength of sin is the law. Where's your sting, death? And then he said, oh, grave, where's your victory? Where's your grave? Where's your victory, grave? Where is it? And that's all been defeated. It's all been settled. It was settled before you were ever born. Hallelujah to God. Amen, amen. So let's look at his kingdom. Look at Revelation 21, verse 1. His kingdom. I saw a new heaven, new earth, first heaven, the first earth were passed away, no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. Oh, woo! <laughs> Meditate on that for a moment. <laughs> he will dwell with them. Do you see now the end, goal, end game? Do you see the purpose? Do you see why you were made? He said, he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. He shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Amen. This is a veil of tears. If you haven't cried yet, you will. If you haven't lost somebody in your life that's dear and near and dear to you. And thank God you haven't. 
I don't wish any sorrow on anyone. But the day will come if you live long enough that you'll carry the body of that blessed mother or that dear father or that dear husband or that dear wife out to the cemetery. And all of these things will become real to you. Then you'll begin to think, what's it all about? What's the meaning in life? And here it is given to you. New, 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 new. New, new, new. I'm going to spend a thousand years just watching that river of life flow down from the throne. Man, ain't that something? Just look at that. A thousand years. What's a thousand years in eternity? It's not even a second. It's not even, there's nothing. You're going to live forever. You ready for it? Do you, do you understand that the worst thing God could do is let a sinner, full of his sin, the curse and damnation that comes from sin, let him exist forever? That's all he's got to do. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? Death. Death. Well, the opposite of that is that we are new, new, new. I got some people I want to meet. I want to see them again. I want to hug them. Take them by the hand. Tell them I love them that I miss them and have missed them for some time. I want to see them again. I want to see the prophets. I want to see the apostles. I don't see Isaiah. I don't see what they look like. I'd like to see Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. I want to see these prophets. And I want to see David, the king. I want to see him. I want to see the apostle Paul and apostle Peter and James and I'm Nathaniel, he said, an Israelite and who no guile at all. I want to see them. I want to see them all. But I want to see Jesus. I say, preacher, what are you going to see when you see him? You're going to see the desire of all the nations. You won't be disappointed. Do you realize, folks, that if it wasn't anything else, nothing else, just you and the Lord Jesus, You'd be satisfied for eternity. You would be. Because he'll answer every question. He'll soothe every heart. He'll heal every wound. We're leaving this old world behind. We're separating from it. I told you once before, and you might have forgotten, but I'll never forget it. There was a great preacher a couple of hundred years ago. He came down to the last few moments of his life. He knew he was leaving. He knew he was leaving. And it's a natural thing, even though you're a believer in Christ, to still have some trepidation about death, the unknown. How many of you understand what I'm saying tonight? <laughs> We're not at, I'm not going to go out here and jump off of a cliff. I'm going to wait for God to call me. But anyway, he came down to his last few moments of life. It was about over with. It's finished. He'd served the Lord. He was a good man. He's, he's a good man. He loved God. And then the room came alive. It did. So how do you know it did? He told him it did. He said, my, 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 and raised his head up. He said, why have I ever feared anything? What a glory and what a beauty that has come into this room. Even so, and his soul left his body. And there his body slumped away, empty, finished, done for. It's only good for about 60 or 70 years anyway. Mine wore out. But his spirit and his soul sailed on into the presence of God. I've never buried anybody in this graveyard. And believe me, I have forgot counting the number of times I've been out there. I don't bury people out there. I bury dead bodies out there. People are gone. So where are you going? Let's say tonight's your last night. We've had two or three people in the church pass away like that. Just They're gone. You know, no warning, no real warning. Good people, good people. And they're gone. So where are you going? What if you never see the sun come up again? What if you never see tomorrow? I say to 10 years ago, I was lying in heart failure. I was weaker than you could. You couldn't believe how weak I was. I know what heart failure feels like. I know all about it. Man, weak. But you know what? That was 10 years ago. I'm still here. 10 years ago. Ten years ago, God's able to heal, isn't he? 
But I get down in my closet and I shut the door and I turn the lights out and I get on my knees. And you know what I tell the Lord? I say, Lord, my life is in your hands. And then I go over there and lay down in the bed and pull the covers up and go to sleep. And if I don't wake up here, I'll meet you by the river. My life is in your hands, Lord. It is, isn't it? Is your life in his hands? Father, bless your word. Bless that one that was led to the slaughter, yet he opened not his mouth. as a lamb to the slaughter. That's one of the things that qualified him to be worthy, worthy, worthy. Father, tonight, if we have anyone in the house tonight that are scared to death of dying, oh, it brings morbid fear to their soul. I feel for them. We don't make fun of that. I don't mock that. I'm not mocking anybody. But what I am trying to say tonight that you can get victory over that. You can get victory where the fear of death will be gone. I pray for that one tonight who knows their sins stand between them and God. Work and try as they may. They cannot get that blight off of their soul. I pray tonight it become very real to them that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanseth from all sin. In thy name I pray. Amen.